Jack Sheldon. Anthony says, when you play flugelhorn like that, you remind me of Jack Sheldon. Javier, nice to see you. Yes, I'm doing good. Where's my stand? There's my stand. So how are you guys doing? So I started off just improvising, and then I realized I was playing... Cherokee, so I just kept going. <laughs> Cherokee at a slow tempo. Hello from Turkey. Bur Burak. Bur Budak. Is it Budak or Burak? Nice to see you guys. All right. <laughs> cool stuff says you sound really great. Um, okay, all right, nice to see you guys. You know what I wanted to start with? Um, something I said last week has been bothering me. Um, Kayla was asking about college, and, and it's not what I said to her that bothered me. It's, I said that I made a mistake not finishing college college, uh, finishing my degree, and you know what, I, I had time to really think about that this week, and the truth is, the way that all went down, I would have probably done the whole thing all over again, exactly just the way I did it, and um, so I shouldn't actually be saying it was a mistake, <laughs> right, if you would do it all over again, that's not a mistake, <laughs> okay, so I think I just shouldn't have ever gone to university. I think that's the bottom line. I don't think it was right for me to go to university. I was under the impression that the whole point of university was to learn, and that's actually not true. It used to be true. It's not true anymore. Um, everybody that I know, and in fact, they used to tell me this back in those days, right? They would tell me, Eddie, shut up, keep your mouth shut, get the degree, and move on, right? And I just couldn't do that. If something didn't make sense, I had to ask. And when they said, keep your mouth shut, it's not because I was disrespectful or anything like that. They told me to keep my mouth shut. Stop asking questions, <laughs> right? And, you know, if something doesn't make sense, at the university level, you would think that the teacher's job would be to make it make sense. Um, and the questions I was asking, um, this this guy just didn't have answers for him, and he took it personally. He 
my my college years, my university years ended with him telling me, how dare you question my authority? And I'm I'm like what is <laughs> what is the job of the student and what is the job of the teacher? If the student doesn't understand, how is the student supposed to understand without asking questions, right? So as far as I was concerned, um, I was at university to, to learn. And if there was something else going on besides that, then, then that's not something I was interested in ever, right? Whatever that is. So anyway, I just wanted to start with that to clarify um, because I've been thinking about it all week. The stuff that happened, that the sequence of events that happened that prevented me from getting my degree, everybody, I mean, every, every one of those situations, if they were to come up again, I would have done exactly the same thing all over again. It wasn't just one event. It was a, a bunch of events. And what ended up happening is that I ran out of money. And I just couldn't pay for university anymore. And after what? Eight years, nine years of school. <laughs> anyway, I just wanted to start off with that. Um, I learned a lot. And in that regard, I got what I went there for. In every, in every way, what I needed, what I wanted, I got it. The degree to me was always secondary anyway. So um, I know it doesn't work that way in the real world. But uh, to me, the learning is more important than that piece of paper. And that's especially true in a career on this thing, right? Anyway, got any questions? I just thought I would start off with that. Javier says, what is your opinion on old trumpets versus modern ones? You know... I like the old ones. Um, I think the old ones have more character. And I think this is just as true for the old musicians, by the way. I think, so, uh, just talking about the, the orchestral guys, right? The orchestral guys have perfected the art of getting a great sound. And I think that their sounds are so perfect that it wipes out all the character. You know, I, I don't think there's even uh, a smidgen of character. Even I don't even think there's a tiny bit of character in the new guy's sound compared to the guys in the old, old days, right? And I think it's the same kind of thing, right? The new trumpets are designed in such... Wonderful ways. Now, <laughs> that said, that's one of the reasons I like this horn is because it's not like that. Okay? And that's also one of the reasons why I haven't made a review of this instrument because all the stuff that I like about this horn will, could be taken negatively. And I don't mean it negatively, and I don't know how to voice this stuff in a way that that would not sound bad. Um, I don't. So I like this horn. I like it a lot. I don't want to say anything that's going to hurt <laughs> the guy who made it, right? Um, I have a, a a history of hello, Gabriel. Yes, that's a pudgy pudgy. Um, I have a history of complimenting people and getting in trouble for it. In fact, one time, about 20 years ago, I complimented somebody, and he on, on my website, 
He read it within 24 hours. How that happened, I don't know. He read it within 24 hours. Um, and then um, called me up and issued death threats. I was complimenting the guy. He managed to find the only thing non-complimentary about it and decided he was going to uh, threaten my life. <laughs> so I try, and I can see how something like this, right? Here I am saying that modern horn makers make stuff that's it's so refined and so perfect it's got no character, right? But that what does that say about this if I say that's why I like this horn? So that's a hard situation for me to um, navigate. So yeah, Javier, I didn't pay, I don't think I paid full price for this because it's not, this was a, a prototype. Basically, he took pieces and put it together for me, which I think makes it worth more than a than a assembly horn, right? Um, but yeah, he just took pieces that he had on the, in the shop and put a horn together for me. Because what happened was I was at ITG. This was the first horn I played on. And I told him I was going to save up my pennies and and give him a call. And when I finally had my, my money saved up, he goes, oh, that horn. That was a one-of-a-kind one horn. And he already sold it. And I'm like, oh, no. And so he said, I'll, here's what I'll do. He said, I'll make you another prototype. And he says, um, so this is the second prototype of this model. He says, I'll make you a, a second prototype. Um, but this is, he said, the thing that he wanted to do differently was these, this bend here. The, it's, it's like a heart shape. If you turn it upside down, it's like a heart almost, or a butt, huh? Um, so yeah, he said. I, I he said, told me he asked me, he asked me if I was okay with that, and I said, you know, if you think it's gonna sound good, do it. And so yeah, he made this for me. And right, so Anthony says, um, Anthony says the horn you have is a natural finish, no lacquer. That's right. Um, I actually prefer them that way. The people in the audience don't. Um, people like the silver. They like the shiny stuff, right? But I, I prefer the, the, the unfinished. We call it raw. I like a raw horn. And, um, because of the vibrations. So kind of sort of what I was telling you guys last week. So, so yeah. Um, now I, I think I, in my opinion, the the reason I like this horn is the re same reason why I like the sound of those old the other horns, the the older horns. Now, if I like the old horns so much, why don't I play on them? And the biggest reason is because it's kind of hard to find those old trumpets with large bore. And I can't play on, on anything smaller than a large bore. So, um, so that's why I haven't bought. That said, that horn I bought for my son is a, a medium large or a small bore even. Um, and I guess I do okay on that. I won't, I won't practice on it or anything. So I guess it's more than just the bore. Anyway, what are the questions? All right. So yeah, you know, if if I'm playing, if I'm playing a tune that has changes. Oh, you have a question? Yes, Gabriel. What's your question?
So um, I want to share that with you guys. For me, you know, as jazz players, like the, one of the pinnacles of great jazz playing is playing the changes, right? And, but I think the way they teach that is all wrong. Does the, this is Anthony, does the finish on the horn affect the sound as opposed to a shiny lacquer horn? Um, so, yes, all of this stuff does affect the, the sound. All of it. Everything you do to the horn will affect the sound. Now, how much does it affect it? That's the question. And if, you, you know, so we don't worry about that kind of stuff with a beginner because a beginner isn't getting good enough of a sound for it to matter. And I also have a, 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 a theory, a philosophy that says that if you, if the way you play, like we know that Chet Baker used to play flat on purpose. He would play flat to the horn. This makes people's heads spin sometimes when you talk about that. He would play flat to the horn and then pull the slide in and that's how he got that beautiful sound that he's got. But when you play that way, then the the stuff you do to the horn, whether it's got lacquer or no lacquer, is not going to make any difference whatsoever. Okay? That's my philosophy on that. Okay, Gabriel says, I'm not obsessed with high range since I'm following you, but what's the average range for an average trumpet player? I would say there's no such thing. There's... There's no such thing as an average range. Um, you know, I guess you could say high C is an average range. What happens, I think, with, with, with the range is that people start to level out after they reach what they need. And really, what we need as trumpet players rarely goes higher than high C. Gabriel says, I mean, I can touch a D over the staff at the moment. Well, that's good range. So, yeah, so I think high C, um, the, the C right beneath that, I think high C is kind of sort of the standard for, I wouldn't say average because people are all over the map. There is no average. I wouldn't call it an average. But I think there's a standard when someone, that's why, by the way, I call my routine for the, for the high C level, I call that the pro level, right? Once you can play high C, you're, you've got a range that's high enough to play most professional gigs. I know that there's people out there that says, but, but what about this and what about that? I said most professional gigs, <laughs> right? And sure, if you live in New York, or Los Angeles where they have big bands and the lead trumpet player has to play up to Super C and above on a regular basis, maybe that doesn't apply. But, you know, I've been to different cities and um, played on different gig scenes and I, it just really is high C is the standard. Gabriel says, can you please be so kind to give the fingering for the notes over D I don't know them. I don't know how to try them. Okay, so from from F from here. <laughs> from from F up, all of the notes are the same as the octave below, but uh, beneath, right? So, so I guess what I mean is to start from this F, right? From that F, everything is just that, just the same fingering as the octave beneath it. Now it doesn't have to be, and there are some people that come up with alternative fingerings. The reason I use those same fingerings is because it helps, and most people do, by the way, but it helps keep us from getting lost <laughs> right up because it's so easy 
So let's say you're playing. It's so easy on, on those notes to be even a half step off. And uh, that's complicated when you start introducing other fingerings. Okay? It becomes complicated. So anyway, you, uh, uh, whatever it is, whatever the note is, the octave beneath it, that's what the fingering is. Okay? So, um, so yeah, that's, that's really how it comes. What else? Javier says, at what volume should you practice? Meso forte, everything. That's my opinion. And let me tell you what my definition of meso forte is. Totally comfortable volume. Not, so I look at everything. And you know what? I, I've seen some music that's written with an M, right? Where it's just meso. Meso, right? So if you're, uh, you know, it's kind of rare. But if that's if you're including that as a as a volume, then that's what I'm saying. Um, and and so anyway, so let's say we are using that as a system. The way I look at this is meso piano is. Uh, oh, yeah, meso piano is one degree of discomfort softer than your most comfortable volume. Piano is two degrees um, softer than your most, uh, in terms of comfort, than your most comfortable volume. Um, pianissimo is three degrees and... Um, Whatever the fourth one is, three three Ps, that's four degrees away. And the same works in the other direction. So I look at it in terms of comfort. Now, what I just told you is um, the way I look at those dynamics is as a soloist. If you are in an ensemble, that's all out the window, right? So meso whatever volume you're at is set by the other musicians. I hope that makes sense. So I'm sp speaking here strictly on a soloist basis. Meso forte is your most comfortable um, volume. And that's what you should be practicing at. Jordan Scanlon, hello. I don't know if you can tell me a solution to this, but I have a Jupiter flugelhorn and the water keys are not the traditional spring style. When I play, the instrument tends to get a lot of moisture. It makes it hard to play without getting a gurgling noise. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, you know what? That's kind of hard to, to... Is it brand new? I wasn't laughing at you. I was laughing at Gabriel. He says I have a gorgeous Italian pronunciation. <laughs> if it's brand new, I wouldn't worry about it. That's kind of normal. Um, a lot of horns get that. It's because the inside is so slick that the, the, the droplets form so fast. And so what happens is over time, there's like a crust or something. <laughs> it's kind of disgusting, but there's a crust that develops on the inside of the horn. And it, I think it almost works like an insulator or something. And then all of a sudden, you're not, after a while, you just don't get that much fluid. Do you have the, do you have this, oh, what is it? Is this what you have for water keys? This the this is called the Amato water key. Or do you have a Saturn one? Saturn one has the, the ring around it that you, you push around the side. But that should not affect 
whether the water gurgles or not. You know what else is the problem is, so if I try to empty my spit valve with the, with the horn like this, and I wouldn't, um, the water's sitting here. It's not going to come out. You actually have to push, uh, tilt the horn in a way that the, the, the water key is actually down at the bottom. Otherwise, the, the water won't come out. Okay, MJA2004. Hey there, I'm a student who plays your etudes. Yay! And I just want to say that this year and the year before, the etudes were amazing. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. That kind of goes with what I was going to say about playing changes, right? I think the reason my etudes, people like the etudes, right? And I think the reason my etudes sound the way they do, as opposed to the other etudes that, that we've seen over the past, right? I think the reason the, the, the reason they sound like that is because they, they make the changes, but they make the changes motivically, not just trying to play the notes. So, this, uh, so I think it's absolutely wrong when you're trying to improvise to try to play the chords. What you should be doing is playing language that emphasizes the chords. So like when I'm playing a, a um, turnaround, let's say I have a three, six, two, five, one go, going over and over again. I'm gonna go real slow. So I'm not playing the, the chords. I'm playing motifs that hint towards or suggest or outline the, the chords. But I'm thinking motivically. I'm not thinking about what the chords are. And that's what those etudes have. The, the etudes actually use the language to um, communicate what the chord structure is. Well, thank you for letting me know that. I'm glad you did. Did you um, audition already? Because I know a lot of people have already finished all that stuff. Um, Jordan says that it is the same as the Amato key on my horn. So yeah, that should not affect whether the water collects or not. Um, Gabriel says, Eddie, have you ever experienced pain on your left arm holding the trumpet? Yes, sir. <laughs> Yes, I have. It gets, you know, there's so much that the body has to get used to holding the instrument. You know what the hardest pain is? The most, the most excruciating pain I ever had was when I switched to this finger, this, this hand position. Because what this does is it puts all of the weight of the trumpet on this finger. And I'm talking for six months I was in, inflamed all here. I was extremely sensitive all through here for like six months. That was back in the early 80s. Oh, man, oh, man, oh, man. I, I do believe it's a great way to play because look what it does to your, to your, um, you have so much flexibility what you can do with the slides. And, it, and when you do that, it doesn't jolt the horn, right? If you're holding the horn this way and you move your slides, it jolts the horn. So that's why we use this fingering. I, I, I keep calling it a fingering, this hand position. Um, but yes, that was painful and painful up and down here for different reasons. Um, both, both the bones and the, the muscle have hurt over the years. Jordan says, I usually try to tilt it and blow with one or two water keys open at a time. Okay. So like I said, the new horns, they, they, they really do collect a lot more water. It's be, you know, remember that the, the, the instrument works like a, what do you call it, a um, still, right? It works just like a still. So you have warm moist water, uh, warm, warm, moist air going through the instrument 
and then the the regular room temperature air um, is cooling it. It's it's cold cooler than your body temperature most of the time, and so that collects that makes the 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 stuff um, collect on the surface. Now, if the inside is less clean and it's, starting to have that crusty stuff build up on it. I don't think it does that as well. So basically what you have is a still that that is real efficient right now at pulling uh, water out of the air. Gabriel says he loves with, Go With The Flow. That's, you know, that's such a nice book. The And, and I say that having very little memory of ever having written it. I'm not saying it like, oh, I'm so good. I'm just saying it's got nice melodies in it, nice little uh, ideas and stuff. It really is an uh, uh, interesting book too. Anyway, well, thank you, Gabriel. Um, MJA says, yeah, we auditioned and I made region band. Congratulations, very good. Bota, hello, how are you, Bota? Nice to see you again. Kayla, he, she says, hello, Eddie, how are you on this lovely Friday? I'm having a lovely day, thank you. Javier says, my hand hurts sometimes because I go a heavy, <laughs> a heavy copper mute. <laughs> Feels like pumping iron. <laughs> What book of yours is good for practicing changes? You know, I don't, it's not in a book yet. That's like one of the books that's taking me the longest to write. You know, I started writing that stuff in the 80s and I'm still not there yet. You know, I, I, I watched, a, I, I listened to a podcast, very interesting podcast from this guy that does a series of, in the UK, uh, a financial series, but he's, it was um, Cautionary Tales, I think is the name of it, Cautionary Tales or something like that, for adults. And he was talking about um, Darwin and some other scientists. Darwin had books he was working on for over 40 years. <laughs> and I, I told my wife, I said, see, I'm not the only one. <laughs> But yes, I have a bunch of books. And you know what? I, I, I'm assuming if he was anything like me, there's going to be dozens of books he never finished when he died. Um, so yes, I don't have any books for that right now. Um, I wish I did. So really, the, the most important thing is to learn a language I think the language is what gives you the changes. Now, here's the thing also. My approach, and, and I said this in that one video, you might have watched it already. My approach is that you have to learn the chords first, right? And the way I believe in learning the chords is you first do an expansion first, okay? Do an expansion. What do I mean by expansion? So if we're doing C, major seven, you're going to do just the first two notes. And while you're doing this, you're looking at the chord symbol. I used to take a, a piece of paper, write the chord symbol out, and stare at that while I'm doing these, these exercises, not stare at the notes. We don't look at the notes. We don't need to look at the notes because of this exercise. So here's the expansion exercise. We do this. C major seven, right? And then we sing da da da, da da da, da da da. All this time you're staring at that chord symbol. That's a very important part of it. Da da da. You're gonna do that ten times. Then you're gonna do the next note up. Staring at the chord symbol. Do that ten times and go all the way up. 
Ten times. Ten times. Take it up to your top range and then do the bottom part. So until you have, you've expanded it out to your top range and your bottom range. Now all this time you're staring at the chord symbol. Okay, not the notes. When you do 10 times, you don't have to look at the notes because you, you're, if you did the first one 10 times, then the next one is just one more note. So you don't really need to stare at the music while, while you're um, doing the exercise. So that's the first thing we do. Then after you've done that, you do... Uh, so that's the expansion. The expansion is always just an introduction. We don't just keep doing that. I have one student that likes the expansion. He's an older gentleman, and that's okay too. I mean, if 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 someone finds that the expansion really helps them get centered on the horn and focused, that's a good thing. I'm not saying now shalt not do it anymore after you do it the first time. I'm not saying that. But the purpose of the expansion is to introduce you to the chord or to whatever it is that we're expanding, right? So... Um, after you've done that, you switch to these other exercises that are just like the first 12 tonalization studies, but they're on the arpeggios instead. So like the three note pattern. Then you flip it just like the tonalization studies. Then you invert it back and forth. Then invert it the other way. And we do that for the first 12 exercises in the tonalization studies. Right on the on the each chord. Now we only do one of those sets per day. We don't do more than one arpeggio set per day. And I actually have a sheet where you keep track of the ones you've done. I recently just started a new one, and you know I'm not a I'm not afraid to share with you stuff that would normally embarrass people. I've never been afraid of that. The truth is I haven't been practicing much lately because of this new book. So you're going to see now my arpeggios. The last time I did an arpeggio was like a week and a half ago, I think. So this is a sheet where I do keep track of my arpeggios. And I just started a new sheet. Arpeggio, arpeggio practice grid. See that? And basically what I do. Now the reason it's like this right now, I'm going down the major sevens, right? But I don't have to. What if I have something that I want to do over here? Well, I put the date over here. And that keeps me from being redundant. I don't want to be redundant. Okay. Now, just so you can see what it looks like, here's one that's completely filled out. Okay. And um, so, and that's just doing one a day. You don't have to do more than one a day if you're doing it like this. And it takes, it takes really, it takes like, less than five minutes to do your arpeggios. There's no reason not to do arpeggios. Most people just forget. Anyway, that's a big part of learning how to play changes is to know what the chords are, not know them intellectually, know them on your fingers. That's the first step. If you can't do that, there's no, there's no sense in talking about even trying to play changes if you can't play the chords, right? I hope that makes sense. 
anyway, um, Gabriel says, I used to go, I used to go to the flow, I go with the flow a, a lot as a very nice warm up. Well, good. I used to do that. I think I went a whole like four or five months where that's all I did for warm up was that go with the flow book. It makes a nice little warm up, right? And it's, it's a musical warm up. It's like, yeah. Anyway, Kayla says, a college professor told me I should invest in the Sloshberg book. How would this book benefit my playing? What do you think of it? So, Kayla, you want to be a music teacher, right? I would tell you that you should own all of the trumpet staples. You, you almost have a, a responsibility for it. Um, unless you don't plan on teaching trumpet at all. Right? If you just want to be band director and you don't want to teach any trumpet stuff at all, which doesn't make a lot of sense to me, right? But I guess there are some people that let their trumpet playing go when they get to college, um, you know, to become band directors. And I, I don't know. that To me, that doesn't make sense, but there's people that do it. If you are going to teach any trumpet at all, you need to, you know, this is kind of a weird thing for me, right? Because I teach... Um, I teach um, mostly my own materials. And there's a reason for that. It's, it's not an egotistic thing. I, I write my own materials only because the specific needs of the students can't be met with those other books, right? So, but here's the thing. If my students tell me that they want to major in music, we will make sure that they're that they have a at least a perfunctory understanding and um can play and we want want to make sure they can play all the stuff too of the staples because those those staples are important and if you get to if you get the university <clears throat> and they say do the clark study and you're like the, the clark what um, that's not going to go very well for you, right? And and it just happens that the Schlossberg is one of those books. Arben, Schlossberg, and Clark. Um, I would also put on that list um, Irons. And um, there's just a bunch of them, really. There's there's a, a, a whole list of, of books you should have um, like that. And that's without even getting into the etude books. So Conconi, I would put in the in the category of etudes, but yes, that's, those are good books. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, Bota says, I always press the third valve halfway to empty the third valve slide. Uh, respectfully, oh, respectively, I press halfway all three valves to empty the tuning slide. That's an interesting concept. I could see how that would work because you're adding resistance and that would help when you're blowing to push the water out. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you for sharing that. I never really even thought about that. That makes a lot of sense. Anthony says, you have me changing to a different horn every day <laughs> to keep my main horn from getting worn. <laughs> Played a little cornet one day, an old vintage con trumpet, and one thing, now all my horns are clean. Very good. That was the deal I made with my son. I told him, it's still your horn, but since you're not playing with, playing it, because when, when I had to borrow it, it was in bad shape. Um, so I said, how about I make you a deal? I'll take care of your horn. It's always yours. You can always take it when you want it, um, but I'll keep it in good shape. I'll keep it clean and oiled up and all that stuff. And whenever he needs it, he can just take it. And so that's the deal we have. And you're right. If you, if you, that's something I started doing only on the jazz. I, when I'm doing all the other stuff, I practice only on this horn. But on the jazz, I actually have it built into my schedule to um, rotate through the different instruments. That's actually pretty new. I have, I didn't used to do that. That's something I'm doing now. Javier says, got it. Thank you, Eddie. Should the 
cord expansion be done after or before the tonalization studies? It should be done before and only as an introduction. Only as an introduction and not even necessarily on the same day, right? So let's say the, the first day you do the, let's say you're doing that sheet, right? C major seven, you do the expansion study first. Then the next day, come back and do the tonalization studies on it. And then once you do that, you, you're, you're good on that tonalization, on, on that arpeggio for until you cycle around to the next set. Kayla says, I want to teach trumpet for sure. Okay, well, there, yeah, good. So there's there's actually a lot of a lot of books that you you should have. And you know, nowadays people are doing digital, like PDFs, and I, I'm not sure how I feel about that. I'm you know I think there's something about having a physical copy that is just more reassuring. And you know what? Because we do have digital, you can have a physical copy and um, not have to actually open it. You can, you can read it on, on your computer, but have the physical one as a backup. Um, Anthony says, Schlossberg owns a nice suit. Check, <laughs> check out his book, Second Page. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah. Okay, I read that already. Um, Bota says exactly. I think you're talking about the air pressure. Um, Gabriel says, Arvin never goes up higher than B. Um, that's true. Well, there are some high C's in there, but, you know, I don't think there's anything higher than that. So, you know, that used to be the, they used to think, this is part of jazz history, right? The people used to believe that you couldn't play trumpet higher than, which, you know, that's that's the jazz history. They say you couldn't play higher than high C, and, and when the jazz guys would play higher than high C, they would want to look at the instrument and see what was, was causing that. But the truth is, a couple hundred years ago, they were playing that high already. So there's some weird stuff in the jazz history. And I'm not saying it's not true, but why would they say nobody's ever played that high before when we have documented proof that they've been playing that high? <clears throat> Alex. Hello, Alex. I think this is your first time here in a while. What would be a good book to use? I'm in high school and my instructor has mentioned Arvin before, but I'm not sure. <clears throat> so, you know, the Arvin's okay. You know what I have a problem with Arvin? And this got me in trouble with a famous trumpet player, not that I care. I'm not a respecter of persons. Um, what I don't like is Arvin worship, <laughs> right? There's people who, who now you, you guys have heard me talk about the trumpet god, right? Not worshiping the trumpet god. A lot of times, there's, I remember this from when I was a kid, people would carry the Arvin book, and, and I would, I had an Arvin book. I didn't carry it around. I didn't need people to know I had an Arvin book, <laughs> right? And so, you know, when I got older, I used to, to, to I guess, tease some of the students, and I'd say, Oh, that's a nice Arvin book you've got there. And I'd say, what what pages are you practicing out of it? And almost always they were only doing that one page out of the whole book. That's the only page they're practicing. And they're carrying this big big book along with their trumpet everywhere they go, it really was, I, I really think that's more of a 
social like status thing. Oh, look, I, I have Arvin. And so the Arvin is a good book. I'm not saying anything against it. It is a good book. Um, the question I would have is why are you getting it? What is it that you're trying to accomplish? Each book has its own different purpose. Each book solves a different problem. And the Arvin book is a method that has no method. It's So there, you, you almost have to have someone take you through the Arvin book before you know what to do with it. I hope that makes sense. So what is a good book to use? If you want to have... Now, of course, I would say my books, right? Um, my Chops Express book, my, my One Range book... But if you're not into buying my books, you can, um, a very good book that helped me understand how to practice what a, what a, what a routine warm-up is, is the Ernest S. Williams Technique and Pre Preservation, I think is what it's called. Um, it's basically the first of all routines. Um, and it's what inspired me to, to even write routines in the first place. If it wasn't for that book, I don't think I would have ever, ever written my first book and my second book. So much of what I've written has come from that Ernest, just conceptually, Ernest S. Williams. You, you can really say that that the Ernest S. Williams, that my books are a extension of that, a more detailed extension. So I would recommend that if you don't want to do my books. I hope that makes sense. Um, Javier says, is the airy sound on the trumpet made by a more relaxed lip? Actually, no. Airy sound is more a sign of using too much pressure often. Now, don't forget that airy sound is also normal. Airy sound is almost normal. The, everyone has an airy sound. It's just how airy is it? Um, how far away do you have to be before you don't hear that airy sound anymore? But if you put your ear right up to somebody's bell, you're going to hear the same airy stuff that you're, you're, you're hearing with anyone that has an airy sound. And also, don't forget that sometimes what sounds like an airy sound has nothing to do with the sound and has more to do with articulation. If you have a, have a fuzzy attack, then um, that's going to be perceived as an airy sound. I hope that makes sense. Now, you can have a more airy sound if your lips are dry. That's, that's people who have more of a, a rolled in like that. Like if they're really, really rolled in, then they're, they're vibrating on the skin instead of the mucous membrane. And that can have more of an effect. Also, having chapped lips can have an effect. All right. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm I'm sorry that this is scrolling, and um, I I think I skipped some. Gabriel says, Eddie, any tip for a better attack? So the thing about getting a better attack, I think the most important thing is making sure you're in tune and in tune from the very beginning and in tune in your head, not so much in tune on the horn. If it's in tune in, the, in your ears, it will be more, uh, you, you will have better attacks then. So it really is nine times out of 10, it's a, a ear training thing. Um, there are some other things, but I would say mostly. So if you do solfeggio, sing it first, then do it on your mouthpiece. 
and then play it on the horn and see if that doesn't help. Sing it in solfeggio and then um, play it on the mouthpiece and then play it on the horn and it should clean a lot of that stuff up. Gabriel says, Mr. Williams' complete method is very good. I prefer it over Ar Arvin. Okay, I'm not familiar with his complete method. I didn't even know he had one. That's, I don't know if I told you, Gabriel is the one that said that. Sorry about that. I might have left your name out. Um, and I'm still jumping around. <laughs> okay, Javier says, Arvin is boring. <laughs> and so this part is very nice. Javier says, on the other side of, on the other side, tonal tonalization is funny. That makes a cloudy day seem sunny. <laughs> All right. All right. Anthony says, Arvin, oh, Irvin Agnes. What is that? Irvin Agnes. He's asking me if we've ever heard, if I've ever heard of him. No, I don't think I have. Irvin Agnes. Gabriel says, Mr. Williams, oh, I already read that. Sorry, I'm jumping around. I'm, I'm, okay. Alex says, how can I get rid of a double buzz? So, you know what? Double buzz is one of the things that I'm kind of sort of most famous for, believe it or not. He says, I've had this trouble for about three years already, and I've noticed that it comes and goes randomly when I'm chopped and when I'm barely warming up, yes. So I think maybe you and I have talked about that before, maybe. So double buzz, and, and people like to say I'm wrong. The, the answer to double buzz is to do all three levels of rest. So I'm going to ask you, first of all, have you seen my three levels of rest video? And if you have seen it, are you doing all three levels? Um, Anthony says, do room size acoustics make a difference when you practice? Funny, because I heard someone on YouTube play something. It sounded great, but I realized it sounded like he was playing in a large hall. Of course, it makes a big difference. Room size acoustics make huge difference. In fact, sometimes it's actually better to not have that big room acoustic stuff because that covers a lot. You know, those, those little cubicle bat practice rooms that they have at the schools, that's a great way to practice because you hear everything, every little flaw. It's a little depressing, <laughs> right? It can be a little depressing but you will hear everything in your sound. Um, so yes, Alex, if you haven't seen that video, look up Eddie Lewis, Three Levels of Rest. That's my answer to the double buzz problem. And a lot of people say, well, how is that even possible? You know, because what makes them think that I'm wrong is that they can go two weeks without playing and be completely fresh and they'll pick up the horn and they'll have the double buzz. That doesn't explain it. That that doesn't negate what I'm saying. Okay. Um, because the the I'm not exactly sure how the levels of rest work. I just only know that they work. I'm not like a scientist. I haven't like taken all this stuff to a lab or anything. Um, this is, you can say that it's anecdotal, but tell me it's anecdotal after you've done it for like a few months. And then tell me that you still have um, double buzz and then we'll we'll talk about it nobody nobody has come back to me after that and said yes i still have double buzz okay um kayla asks do i offer a sample lesson i used to i don't do that anymore um and and the reason why is it 
well, I'm not going to go into that. Um, I I did for a long time, and then I just quit. I there's it was not working out very well. Um, Anthony says yes. An old teacher of mine told me in my old house in Brooklyn, I had a dead sounding room. He thought it was better to practice like that. I I actually do believe that. That said, there's something also very nice about getting on a stage and practicing where there's really nice acoustics um, so that you can actually enjoy your sound. So I actually believe both ways is good. But if you're really looking at wanting to improve, the small rooms are better. Javier says, I used to get a double buzz when I abused my lip playing like a madman. Yeah. So it's almost impossible to abuse yourself. Okay, I shouldn't say that. I can now, now something pops into my head, and I'm not even going to say it, but there are some ways you could abuse yourself. But I was going to say it's almost impossible to abuse, abuse yourself if you're doing those three levels of rest. So Alex asks one more question about double buzz. When I do the three levels of rest video, will it cure it completely or will it just be a cure that one time? Yeah, I don't think you understand. We're talking about changing the way you practice. We're talking about changing the way you practice. You want to rest at three different levels when you practice. Okay? Um... So um, it will be, it will fix the double buzz. It won't fix it immediately. It will take at least a few weeks for you to do it this way. I hope that makes sense. You have to practice this way for about three weeks and then keep practicing this way forever. Don't ever stop, okay? It should become... Um, second nature to you that you always practice w this way always for the rest of your life um, and yes it should get rid of the double buzz forever for as long as you're still practicing that way okay Javier says three levels of rest is the best thing he ever heard and then he says that it works and it's true now there you know I'm not one of those guys that will say this will cure everything, okay? Um, yeah, there's too many things that ca can cause too many other things. Um, but yes, definitely, I, I, as far as the, the double buzz goes, um, I've never had anyone who did the three levels of rest come back and say, you know what, you were wrong. I did three levels of rest, and it's still there. Nobody's ever said that. And I'm talking about over a period of 20 years, 30 years that I've been teaching this. Okay. All right. So looks like we're out of time. Any other, Maybe one or two questions real quick before we sign off. So we're the book, the new book, I was I was editing files right before I had already sent the book off for a proof and I was editing the files and I realized because I was using the book my, my copy of the book to check and I realized one of them is untransposed that means I have to cancel my order and buy another copy so it might put the, the release date back a little bit, like maybe by a week or something. Um, Gabriel says, by the way, since I'm following Eddie's method, I have gained a lot of range with no effort, and the rests and micro rests are a very important thing. Well, thank you, Gabriel, and I'm so glad that you're that this is all working for you. Um, Javier says, do cornet flugel mouthpieces um, 
can be used on trumpet. If you have an adapter, you I mean, you can make it work, but it's not, it will be out of tune. That's the main problem is it's out of tune and it will also leak. Okay. It will also leak. Well, good. Volta says, yes, me too, about an octave. Yeah. So, Alex, we were, we go live on Fridays at 1 o'clock, and that's Houston time. So, um, depending on where you live. Um, but, yes, Fridays at 1 o'clock, and it looks like it'll be that way for the rest of the year. I used to not do it if I had a gig on Fridays. <laughs> but there's no gigs, so what what can I say? Anyway, I better get going. Lots of stuff to do today. I got to order a new book because of this mistake I made. Um, all right. Oh, okay. So that's beautiful country out there. Alex says he lives in Texas close to the Mexican border. Um, Kayla says, have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, Kayla. And... Yeah, thank you, Javier. Nice to see you guys. God bless you all. Thank you, Bota. Thank you, Gabriel. All right. We'll see you guys next time. Have a great week. All right. See you next time. Bye.